There we go. Not that there's anybody on live stream, but we have to record it. So, oh, and I'm supposed to be recording this, and I forgot yesterday. It's good people remind me. <laughs> um, three, one, six. Oh, the eleventh today. Okay. <clears throat> yes, the voice is a little wobbly today. And kind of interesting. But uh, I, I think it's, it, it, it's trying to take a vacation and it's not being given the uh, permission to do that. So let's see if it'll last through the class, okay? It's a great excuse for chanting classes, okay? Is that the voice is taking a vacation. <laughs> I shouldn't, I shouldn't tell you all these things. It's not, not right to tell you all these things. Okay, so what do we leave it on? Karma Yoga. So, and I, I promised you we'd get to the next verse. So let's see if we can get to the next verse, okay? Why were we talking about Karma Yoga? Anybody remember? Because it's a path to moksha, right? A path? No, <laughs> it's a lifestyle. That's right. It is not, yes, the Kama Yoga and Sannyas discussions, and it's a lifestyle. It is not a pa path, as Swaminiji will say. There are no paths to moksha. There is a lifestyle. Or if you say, want to say there's a path to uh, moksha, we can only say there's one path to moksha, right? So, and what, what is that? Through knowledge, okay? So no... No two paths. We can't go the bhakti path. We can't go the jnana path. We can't go the uh, karma yoga path. No, the only way to moksha is through knowledge. Yes, it is a lifestyle. So what do we do this lifestyle? Why would we all, why would we all want to be karma yogis? Why not just go for sannyasa? They just sit there happily just quietly in some cave somewhere up in the Himalayas, 55 degrees, constant temperature all year round. You know, I have to say that we keep the place at 65 to 67 degrees. 55 might be a little chilly. Nice in the summer maybe when it's really blazing hot. But uh, anyway, 55 degrees, constant temperature all year round. If you're lucky, someone bringing you biksha. I shouldn't say if you're lucky, if you're blessed and your punya includes that, then you get Biksha brought to you. So why, why would any of us want to do this Karma Yoga business? Okay, so first of all, doing Karma Yoga is a misnomer, right? Karma Yoga is what? It, an attitude, all right. See, this is great. <laughs> We're all learning something here. So Karma Yoga is an attitude. It is not, um, it's not a doing. And so it is an attitude. And so why would we want to develop and hone this attitude? And we talked yesterday at the end of the class a lot about a lot of reasons why we might want to develop an attitude of karma yoga and not just go and sit ourselves in a cave somewhere. And we talked about, if you remember, who remembers what we talked about? The simply sitting Swami, right? And the Englishman, the stiff, you know, with the fly on his nose and all the rest of it. And he couldn't get comfortable. And then when people came to look at him, because what a strange sight seeing a British person. James, I know you've got a sense of humor, so that's why I can keep on with this. And plus, you know, when, one's, uh, when one grew up in a place, you know, one, one has the right to kind of poke fun at it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you know, that British person sitting there next to this person in orange look very strange in all of those strange clothes that the British used to wear during the occupation of India, right? I don't know why they used to wear so many clothes when they went, went there, but they did. They used to have to still dress very British. So he was having such a difficult time. So we realized that there are, to retain his Britishness, yes, he was wearing all those clothes, <laughs> didn't want to be identified. Anyway, let's not, let's not go there. There's some rather scary books from those times. So we won't go to the names of those books. Let's just, just stick with what we are. So 
he was sitting there and he realized it was not such an easy thing to just sit there. Why? Because in the brain were all the Raghata Veshas. Oh, the body's got to be comfortable. Oh gosh, there's a fly on my nose. How dare that fly walk on my nose? And how can I stop that? And my goodness, didn't this person take a bath this morning who's just come to look at me? So all of these Raghata Veshas come up, right? Every single one of them. Every time you try and sit and you think, yes, today is going to be the day. I'm going to start a meditation practice. And I'm going to do this daily, half an hour. And what happens if it's not, if it's not something is wrong with the seat, the back, the, you know, the temperature of the room, it's, oh, just remember, that needs to get done. Oh, wow, they, you know, just going to have to go and get this done right now. And um, why? Because, you know, after all, this little jiva here, this little wanting jiva, more important than what's upholding this jiva, so let's go and get it done, you know? So this is the, uh, this is the thought, or this is the uh, illogic that comes. Illogic? Yeah, illogical, I think is the word, actually. So, uh, sorry, getting warmed up here, so I have to, have to uh, uh, unzipper a little bit. <laughs> Okay, so why do we do this karma yoga then? To neutralize all these Raghata So the Raghata come. It's not that, you know, it's not that we're sitting there saying, oh yes, I'm going to make a collection of Raghata <laughs> I'm going to see how many Raghata I can build up. These are built up and Adi. Remember, there is no beginning to this jiva. So one lifetime, enough to give you enough Raghata to last for thousands and thousands, oh, I forget thousands and thousands, billions of lifetimes, okay? So there's no end to these Raghata Veshas. So what does that tell you? We're never going to fulfill them all as well, right? Because there's too many of them. So what are these? We, okay, you keep on about these Raghata Veshas. Great, okay. You know two Sanskrit words, Raga Dvesha. Okay, good. That's really wonderful. What, what is it? Well, the simple translation, right? likes and dislikes it, they're, they're going to tell me. They're very good, you know. <laughs> likes and dislikes, that's the simple. But what, what does it mean, this likes and dislikes? Where, where, you know, what pushes these likes and dislikes? And it's going back to this sense of lack, right? So without this sense of lack, these likes and dislikes would not be there. Huh? How on earth do you work that one out? Okay, so I want to feel good about myself, right? So I have ideas about how that is going to look. For, for any one of us to feel good about ourselves, you know, the body should be like this, the, uh, um, the letters after the name should be like this, um, and then uh, the spouse should be like this, the children should be like this, whatever it is, all of these things should be there. And so that's how we prop ourselves up, is by these external means. So Raghada really are based on that sense of lack, because we're looking outside of ourselves to fulfill that sense of lack. And sometimes we even look inside. Oh, if only that emotion didn't come when, you know, when this happened. Or if only, you know, the brain would think in this particular way. We can say that that's inside, an inside job, right? So either way, these Raghata Veshas come out of this sense of lack. So with, that, with those Raghata Veshas and with that sense of lack is the pressure then to act. And that's where this action comes from. So let's just imagine, for instance, that we have a job interview. I don't think I'm going to be here today. <laughs> let's just imagine you have a job interview coming up. You really want the job. You're just like, oh, yes, this is a job I really want. So what do you do? You spend hours researching the company, right? You go online, you Google it. Not only that, you may even go down to the library and check out a few books, you know, about companies in the past. I don't know, maybe everything's available online now. I, I don't know this, but you check out all sorts of things. You call, you find out the manager's name to make sure that you address the people by their proper names and everything. Um, you brush up on all your skills that you're going to be trying to sell to them in order to get this job. You spend hours in front of the mirror making sure that the suit or the jacket or whatever it is is just correct and not too gaudy and it's not too, uh, doesn't look too uh, 
too much overdressed or underdressed for this particular job interview. So all of this goes into preparing for the job interview. Why? Because I want the job, because in, in the mind, there is something about this job that is either going to bring me some sense of fullness, some sense of wholeness, or it's going to, it, it doesn't matter whether it's great, it's going to allow me to feed the family, or yes, it'll be so good on my resume in the future to have had this job, or how this is just a job that I really would like because I feel like I'm going to be doing something good in the world. It doesn't matter. Whatever it is, one will spend, put a lot of energy into this. So then let's look at the other side. What happens if I don't really want the job? If I'm not interested, if it's, if it's not in some way going to help me feel better about myself, I don't think it's even going to cover the bills, but you know, you have to do it because uh, I, I think, I know it's true in England and I think it's true here. One has to attempt to get a job in order to be able to sign up for the uh, Unemployment. Unemployment benefits, that's the word. Yeah, we call it dole in England. I, think, I don't know if it's called dole. Is it dole here? So, uh, <laughs> so we have to, you know, apply for jobs. And so you're just like, ah, oh, okay, we're just going through the, you know, just going through the motions here. Do you spend hours Googling? No. Do you worry about what you really look for? No, you know, you make sure that it's a clean outfit, but you don't spend hours in front of the mirror. Do you worry about finding out about the names of the people who are down, you know, working at this place? No, not really. You just go and turn up for the job interview. So it's really this, this idea of what's pushing us into action. You have to look at the underlying, the underlying sense of lack, sense of need, sense of want, and what it's propping up to see what's driving the behavior. And so <laughs> this is one of the things that will really give us this pressure then to act, is this sense of lack. This restlessness that comes up, here's another one reason why we'll start acting, and this goes back to sitting, I'm sitting down to do meditation. Nicely the brain settling down, oh, the mantra's coming just nicely. Wow five times without even thinking of something else. I've said the mantra. Oops. Hmm. Guess I just thought of something else. Whoops. Okay. So, <laughs> so, okay. Mantras come back now. Very nice. Very nice. You know, but something's just not quite right. What, what is it? So there's this sense of like, you know, I must have forgotten to do something. What was that? Oh, mantra. Yes, that's right. Oh, come on. Om Namah Shivaya. Om Namah Shivaya. Om Namah Shivaya. Om Namah Shivaya. Om. Oh, that's what it was. Oh, yeah, that can wait. That's okay. That can wait. Yeah, I mean, so, you know, people are laughing. Everybody knows this one. Yeah, that one, that one, that can wait. That can wait. Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya. Wow, that was really good. You just put that aside and just let go of that one. Oops. Oh, Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya. Oh, but what about this? Yes. Oh, oh no, this, I can't. I can't. Yes, you can. You, you can sit here. Come on, just at least 10 more. You can do 10 more mantras. Okay. Om Namah Shiva, Om Namah Shiva, Om Namah. Oh, that must have been 10. Was that 10? I don't know. How many was that? So this restless mind, it's just going everywhere, grabbing onto everything. It's, it, you know, <laughs> the mind really does search for a lot of times, unless one is an absolute couch potato, the mind searches for a reason to make the body move around. It's like, okay, there has to be a reason. Yep, there has to be a reason. Something's happening. You know, something's going on right now. And, <laughs> you know, and in, uh, in Anakati, I had the blessing to sit next to somebody who, for three and a half years, uh, who uh, could not keep the body still for any reason. And Pooja Swamiji actually used to comment on it on a regular basis. She absolutely lovely person, absolutely wonderful person, and uh, still in contact with this person. And uh, she just could not sit still, though. If it wasn't the pencil, you know, you can put the pencil between your finger and tap, tap, de tap, 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 de tap on the desk. You know, if it wasn't the pencil, it was the leg. And of course, we all were very crunched together because when Pooja Swamiji was teaching, everybody wanted to get as close as possible to Pooja Swamiji. So if you 
were one of the blessed ones as I was to be sitting right in front of him. Everybody was piling up on either side, you know, and your, your space was getting, your, your space was getting smaller and smaller, you know, and so the knee would be there and your knee would start going up and down because their knee was going up and down. Did you put your knee underneath or did you put it on top? Did you want, you know, did you want to do the stretch down today or the stretch up today, you know, it just depended on where the knee was. And so there's this, this restlessness of this, this just need of the body to move around sometimes. It's all karma, don't, you know, don't get me wrong, there's no judgment in it, it's all karma. It's things to be aware of though, and things that one can see and look at the push again to make the body move around. What other else do we see? What other pressures do we see? You know, needs. <laughs> This, this is one Swaminiji often says, what is, what was a, um, what is considered or was considered as a luxury back in our parents' day is today a necessity and iPads, in fact I was just reading something that Puja Swamiji had written this morning and he was saying, yeah, it used to be a luxury to have these iPads but now they're an absolute necessity and I was thinking, how do you know this Swami Swamiji? We actually got Puja Swamiji an iPad one time. He looked at it once and he thought it was great fun that you could spin it around and that it would, you know, turn the text up. He thought that was highly entertaining. And then he said, pass me the book, please, the book that was on the iPad. <laughs> so, he, you know, this iPad never did sit well with him. But in a lot of places now, they, I see that a lot of these conferences, uh, you know, this is obviously upmarket conferences, but some of these conferences that you go to, they don't give you an agenda, a paper agenda. You know, you used to get that nice little fold over file thing and tell you where to be. And, uh, you know, it would have little uh, bits in about maps about how to get to various places. No, it all comes on an iPad now. The iPad is tracked, I might tell you, so that they make sure that they get the iPad back at the end of it. But it all comes on an iPad. So yes, what was a luxury is becoming a necessity. We also see this in schools too with kids. They have to, to have computers now to go to schools. I was just horrified. This is all over the world. And in some countries now, they're not even teaching. This is in Europe, I heard this. I think it was about Sweden. They are not even teaching children how to write anymore. They're just teaching them how to type. Now, whether they're teaching them how to type, uh, you know, like this, huh? Or, you know, with the fingers like this, we don't know, but uh, they're teaching them to type. So, so these needs, why, why are we talking about all of this? Because we're talking about needs. Suddenly this, you know, I need that. And so that pressurizes us again into action. I need to get these things. I don't have it. I have to keep up with the Joneses. I have to keep up with the Smiths. Why is it always the Joneses that you have? Now, why can't we keep up with the Smiths instead? Or, you know, what's a good American name? Johnson. The Johnsons. Why can't we keep up with the Johnsons instead of the Jones? <laughs> or the Smiths. Okay. And Nimal is saying online homework, so schools are making, ah, yes, the online homework now, that's right. And I've heard that's kind of a nightmare for the teachers. <laughs> it's more work for them because they have to download, you know, lots and lots of uh, um, documents. But it's, anyway, all of these things which we once saw as luxuries are becoming necessities. And so therefore, again, the body is pushed, the person is pushed into um, working. And it's not just that it's not just these things which yes we can see okay society is moving in this direction so I need to keep up with it we see this too within our own homes and Australia has a lovely example of this uh, we you know people will for no reason uh, I, uh, let's say uh, let me put that again it seems as if there is no reason except the desire to suddenly have everything be different will change the entire decor of the home and so whether it's because the color goes out of style the furniture's out of style um, it, it's usually something it, it, it can't be because the furniture has got old and uh, ratty is a word that we use okay you know the cats had a good claw at it and the, the dogs you know chewed on this corner of it it's not that reason at all some people will just change the entire furniture the whole decor in a room and in australia they actually the um 
the garbage people will actually uh, take this all into account and they have these, um, what are they called? They're called um, hard waste collection days, right? <laughs> they're, they're, all, they're liking this one. <laughs> and uh, the hard waste collection day is when uh, the garbage company for free, the garbage company is the council, it's all run by the council over there, um, for free will come around and pick up your old fridges, freezers, stoves, furniture, beds, bedding, uh, cookware, you name it, they will come and pick it up for free. You just have to put it out and it has to make sure that it's not blocking any sidewalks or anything and you have to put it out 24 hours before they're scheduled to come. And so, of course, <laughs> I know quite a few people in Australia, and this is when they do their shopping, okay? So when their couch or something has been, you know, has got dilapidated because the kids have jumped up, on down, up and down on it just one too many times and gone through the couch or whatever. So they, you know, everybody gets a heads up when this day is. And there you'll see all sorts of people out shopping, you know, by driving up and down the street where this is going on. And, you know, they, their couch goes down where this couch was and the other couch goes in. So it's a nice exchange system, a good recycling system, if you like, but all based on, you know, this idea, OK, I want some change. And then what are they writing here? And James is saying, sounds like my mum. Every time I visit, the house is different. <laughs> it's becoming a running joke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like those little, uh, you know, those cartoons you get, right? And you have to spot the difference. The pictures are very nearly identical and you <laughs> have to spot the difference. Anyway, what's all this based on? This is all based on some sense of lack. There's this push, this drive to change something. If something was just a little bit different, this isn't quite right. This isn't quite, quite how I want it to be. And actually, when I was in Saudi Arabia recently and was visiting some people, they'd been living in their house for five years, but they weren't done decorating, you know. And every weekend they went out to go and pick up something, you know, because, you know, they had to decide what exactly it was and, you know, what color it should be, where it should be located, how it should, if it was light, how it should shed light. So this drive to just make things be different. And then another dry thing that pushes us is, of course, how do I appear to people? How do you look to other people? What do other people think when they look at, at oneself? And of course, the, you know, we see this, the pressure to act so much. We talked yesterday about Vark Tapas, or maybe it was the day before we talked about Vark. So I want to be the one who's in the know. So what do I say? I, oh yes, I know about that. Yes, yes. You know, and I may not know anything about it, but one, can, one tries to waffle one's way through something. Um, and it's usually based on there being a traumatic event when one was a child, you know, and for some reason, what, someone, you got it, the person got into trouble as a child um, for not knowing something, or maybe they were praised for knowing things. It, it, it doesn't matter either way, but there's this idea that one has to know something. You just have to, um, it, it, you know, you just have to take a child and belittle them for not knowing something, enough, done. You know, that child's gonna grow up with some sort of sense of like, okay, I have to, you know, I have to be in the know for this. So but it, it's, it's not a, um, it's not a very, uh, it, it's not a very easy thing to be around sometimes, but we have to, you know, go past that, reach through that to, to have the compassion and recognize that that person has had something happen that's brought this about. So I think these are, the, these are the main ways. I'm sure we could sit here and just make an endless list about you know, what drives us to act, but these are many of the ways. So then we have to talk about the power of Raga Devashas. What do you mean they've got power? Yes, they have a lot of power. What we, we've just been talking about it, the pressure to act. So that pressure comes up. And what happens with that pressure? How does this all start? And we, we talked a uh, last week, I think, about uh, walking past the shop and seeing uh, something for sale in the shop. So what happens first of all? First of all, I start just dwelling on an object. 
and this is all in if, uh, if for those of you who want to look it up um, you can uh, see this in chapter 2 verses 62 and 63 in Gita and so what happens first one starts dwelling on the sense object um, and then what happens then this fancy arises this fancy what's this fancy you know you kind of this is a, like a old English this is you know you, you get a fancy for something it's like oh yeah I fancy some I fancy some ice cream right now that sounds really good uh, yeah just just a little bit of ice cream so this fancy develops and then what happens if you keep on <coughs> dwelling on it then the desire really starts coming in well what's the difference between fancy and a desire a desire is going to really push you into action this is where that is where you're going to get caught a hold of and shaken around a little bit and then from that desire what comes next kamat krodaha right yes and why do we get krodaha why do we get anger why does anger come we don't get what we want out of frustration, yes. And so, but I get what I want, so why, what's the problem? I get what I want and no problem, desire's fine, because, you know, as long as it's fulfilled, it's fine. <laughs> we can never fulfill every desire. So that, so that's enough. Yeah, so we get angry, I guess, you're right, that's it. So the anger comes and we can't fulfill every desire. So these desires are something to be reckoned with. And then Krodat, what comes from that? Anybody remember? Delu delusion, yes. Some more, haha. -ha. So we get this delusion. What do you mean you get deluded from, uh, for, from anger? You get deluded? You think about what happens when you get angry. And I'm not talking about you know your simple it, it, first it starts out as frustration but several times later it's going to become anger and delusion it just really takes the mind away one starts not one isn't at that point when that anger has come one is going to have a very difficult time acting within you know the bounds of dharma within what is dharmic and what is right to do and what's not to do so once you've got to this stage, it's you're on a downhill slide now. And then what happens? Some more heart, what? Smitti nashaha, right? Yeah, that's right. So your, in, your inability to remember anything about what you've learned, anything about the teaching, anything, it, it's, it's over, it's done. Mm, not a nice place to be. <laughs> <laughs> and then it's and then it's it's like a confusion you know you're just so confused and then from that what happens butti nashaha what is that your ability to have any discrimination at all so the 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 ability to discriminate between what's right between what's wrong between atma between anatma any discrimination it's gone and then finally Pranashyati, right? Destroyed. The whole, the whole person is destroyed. And this is what, uh, uh, this is actually referred to quite often as suicide. You know, so this is a little, uh, you know, a little bit of uh, sobering thought about these little, you know, oh, what's the harm of just thinking about this thing? Uh, you know, what, what's the big deal? And Think about what we're talking about, these Raghatavishas, and the Raghatavishas are there, built on this sense of insecurity. And so, okay, so to make myself feel better, what's the harm in me just thinking about, you know, being the ruler of the world, being, you know, as, as, you know just thinking about it, but just dwelling on that a little bit. And then that might lead one, though, into some desire to get a position which perhaps one isn't prepared for or one shouldn't be doing. So all of this has to be looked at and seen, you know, looked through to see what it is that's driving me into this, into this role and the place that we, uh, a place where we may get ourselves into a situation where as yet this isn't, a, you know, either it's a, a place I shouldn't be, for instance, like the bank robber who wants to, you know, become rich 
suddenly, oh, okay, I'm not getting a job, I don't seem to be interviewing well, so I'm just going to plot and scheme, you know, and uh, get myself a job. Or getting into a, getting one into a, um, a pl getting oneself into a place of just trying to blot out the pain of not, you know, not being able to accept who and what I am because I don't know the truth of myself. So this is where these desires can really get astray. And James is saying suicide because we are as though smothering our own real nature by not owning up to it through, our, through ignorance. Yes, that's true. Absolutely, it is suicide in this way. So, and we know what happens, you know, we can say suicide in another way, right? Because uh, what happens at uh, rebirth if we kind of get, you know, uh, one might come back as, uh, you know, like they always talk about the pickpockets coming back as the octopus, you know, and, uh, <laughs> and the sharks, they must have been ones who just, uh, I don't know what the sharks would have been. Uh, they loaned money, the loan sharks, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. See, it's all coming out now. So we have to, it, these ragadavashas are something that we need to look at. There's a lot in the Gita about these ragadavashas and how they are really, um, they are something to be uh, kept on top of. You know, this is something that where the alertness needs to be. And we don't want to let them run away with us, run away with the, the mind, okay? Or the mind run away with them. So, of course, we have to have the opposite, right? Because that was rather miserable. We can't just stop it on that. We have to say, what happens to the one, though, who has these, whose who's, uh, sense organs do not go out and sit happily with the sense objects and, you know, just say, oh, yes, come on, come on, come on, let's think about this a little bit more. What happens for that person? They are vyuktaha. They're not bound by the ragadveshas. And what do they get for that? They get prasada. So they get some sense of tranquility in the mind. So what is this tranquility? What is this shanti? And so what that is, is really what we're all wanting, this moksha. And how, it, what is this moksha? Limitlessness. And what is this limitlessness? It really looks like what, <laughs> what we could say is love, okay? So how Swamiji puts this is discovering love. And so love, is that something that we can demand? Is that something that happens? You know, it's like, okay, right now I just would like you to all sit there and love for a minute, okay? It's like, no, we can't, we can't, uh, but we can't love on demand. And so where is this love? You know, and automatically we see that love is a relation, relationship thing for us. It's something that appears to get invoked from an object outside of ourselves. And so we, we look to something else for it. And what I would say is that love is the relationship word for that fullness that one's... So if there's a relationship, it's love. But if one's just talking about oneself, it's purnaha. It's that fullness, that sense of not lacking. Because love gives that feeling of not lacking. There's nothing to want, there's nothing to change, there's nothing to be different about a situation. Atmana tushtaha, yes, that's the one. We had that word earlier, right, in one of our verses. So that one that's just feeling completely happy within his or herself and by his or herself. And so this love, what brings this love to a stop? How does it come to a stop? usually because things aren't how this object that I'm in love with or this person that I'm in love with suddenly starts behaving in a way that is not in keeping with keeping this sense full over here. And so we start making demands. And what are these demands based on? The answer for every question so far today has been ragadavashas, right? <laughs> these demands are all based on our ragadavashas. And do ragadavashas stay still? And I would say, no, they don't stay still, ever changing. You know, we can think about, uh, <laughs> you know, think about what we used to like to eat when we were children. And, you know, 
I know a, a young, young man, he's a young man now, and thankfully he, he still likes this, but he doesn't eat it all the time. But all he would eat from the age of about three through six, seven years old was macaroni and cheese. And the only way to get any vegetable inside him was to put it in with the macaroni and cheese. <laughs> and if it wasn't cut small enough and, you know, couldn't go in in the same mix, that would be picked out. So it had to be all chopped up very, very finely and put in with this. So, you know, as children, we, we have, we develop these very, very strong um, raga devaishas. And, and, uh, and we get attached to things being a certain way. But then you see how those things change as you grow up because he now actually does eat a wider diet than ragadavacious. I don't know if anybody could live on uh, ragadavacious than mac and cheese. I don't know if anybody could live on mac and cheese for an entire life. It, it might be doable. I don't know. It might not be doable. Um, but definitely with regards to our uh, taste buds, uh, things change. Uh, many of us, you know, have grown up uh, eating all sorts of things that we then come to discover are probably not the best things for us. It's kids in India. Yes, we all, grew, yes. And the thing is, the, the ragas for those sometimes don't change, but what does change is the ability to exercise some moderation with them, right? So we don't, uh, we don't necessarily uh, go ahead and fulfill those desires for those sweets all the time. And we've managed to resolve the mind a little bit about it because we understand that diabetes is something to be reckoned with and that, you know, also cholesterol, oh, computer is doing weird things, uh, and, you know, uh, cholesterol also now they're saying that it's, uh, it's actually sugar that is causing cholesterol build up in the body is what they're saying now. So we, we start to be able to justify in the mind and kind of calm the mind down, stroke it a little bit and say, there, there, it's okay if you don't get your sweets because look how good, this is much better for the body. So we're able to do this and we're able to resolve that. I hope that this uh, Adobe is working for you all. It keep The uh, camera keeps jumping around. I don't know if it's something going on here or some, it keeps going off. Yeah. You know, the live stream, live stream, the live stream is on. I won't be able to follow your, uh, okay. If it's working for you, I think that's excellent. And if it's not working, you can always jump over onto a live stream and try that out. Okay. But it's definitely having some issues. It, it looks as if it's having some issues. It doesn't like this whole discussion it's <laughs> of Raghunathvaishas. It's like, oh, oh, but just when I thought I was the king of the show, the Adobe Classroom, I was the only one. So it's it's having a it's having a hissy fit now because it knows that uh, live stream is catching up to it. Okay. So anyway, you can just move over to the live stream classroom if you need to. So this whole, these raga devaishas, these are what, this is what uh, our demands of other people are based on. And so what we, what we know and what we see in life everywhere is that as these raga devaishas change, then so too does one's feelings about a certain object, a certain person or whatever it is, things shift and change. So how do we, you know, if we say then that what we're really looking for is this love, is this limitlessness, which is love, and it's one's true nature, which is Purnaha, how am I going to know myself as that? And it's like I'm this miserable, of course nobody's looking when I'm saying I'm miserable, because otherwise I'm just, you know, yeah, I'm fine, everything's good, you know, it's all good. And this, you know, plastic smile comes out and, yeah, everything's really, really good. And you're gritting, the, the teeth are gritted in the back of the mouth. I'm, you know, I'm this complaining. But I only complain to certain people because some people I don't want to complain to because, you know, what if they find out that, what if this person finds out that I complain a lot about things and then, oh my goodness, that's my reputation out of the window. You can see how it all works, all the rugged evasions, everything, all in, in uh, tandem and limited. 
You know, I, I'm a very limited being, especially when there's so many saver opportunities, then suddenly I become very limited in every way. So, how do I know myself as love? And these, these are the things that I attach to myself. And so, we'll look at the next verse now. Yeah, this is really, it, it's having great fun today. I don't know what it's doing, but here on this end, just so you all know, it goes into a little black screen with uh, polka dots all over it. The dots aren't dancing, okay? So I don't think it's anything going on here, but anyway, polka dots. <laughs> it's quite, quite entertaining. So let's look at our next verse, which is all about Karma Yoga, right? And we will talk a little bit about that and what that looks like. So it is verse, I think it's the sixth verse, is that right? Mm -hmm. Verse six, and if you've got uh, Gita and you want to be reading it from there, it's verse 247. Kaman yeva dikaraste, Kaman yeva dikaraste, Ma pale shukatachana. Ma pale shukadachana, ma karma pala hetur buhu buhu, ma karma pala hetur buhu, ma te sangos to karmani, ma te sangos to karmani. Yes, very important verse, you're right. So what is this verse saying? And why are we talking about it hot on the heels of love? Let's have a look and see, okay? So, karmani, there's some Sunday rules in here, so how it gets uh, chanted and how it actually gets broken out into separate words look a little bit different. And for you, those of you who are in the Sanskrit class, we, we, actually we could maybe look at the Sunday rules in this one. Uh, in the next class a little bit, but uh, don't worry, you don't have to know Sunday rules in order to understand the verse, okay? So, karmani, in seventh case, so with regards to here, okay? With regards to what is what we want to say, with regards to action, okay? Karma, karman, it's from the uh, noun, karman, action. So, with regards to that, Eva alone, Adhikara, and Adhikara we usually think of, oh, those are all the qualifications, but here this is the sense of um, authority over, a say over. Um, I don't know what it says on the sheet. What does it say? Choice. Choice. Ah, okay. That's the word that uh, Swami uh, Paramatananda uses too. So a choice. So with regards to action, we have some sort of choice, is what it says first of all. Or you, te, you have some sort of choice. Ma paleshu kadachana. So this ma kadachana goes together, but never. Okay, so never, never with regards to what? Paleshu results, never to results. So what does it say? I have a choice over how I act, but what comes as a result of that action? No choice. And then karma pala, pala hetuhu. This hetu, if any of you know any Sanskrit, usually has the meaning of cause, you know, so we can say motivated by, so caused by, and then karma pala, and then this ma buhu, may you not be, so may you not be motivated by, by what? The results of action, karma pala, okay? And also, <laughs> equally important, important, Mate Sangaha Astu Akarmani. May you not be drawn to or attached to in action. Ah, this is the verse we grew up with, they're saying, but never knew how to apply in life. Yes, 
very important verse. So we'll spend a little time on it, okay? Because it's, it, hopefully everything we've done is building up to this so that it makes sense. So with regards to action, there is a choice. And this is where all of the Ragadavashas come into it. This is where we have to have Ragadavasha management, if you like. You know, maybe we should do a class, Ragadavasha Management 101, and then we can graduate to 201, right? And then 301, this is how it goes. We could get PhDs in Ragadavasha Management. It would be a useful PhD as opposed to some of the other ones that are out there, right? You know, a, uh, a no, I, we won't, yeah. That's right, a PhD. I think we can look into it, okay? Maybe, yeah. Maybe now with everybody moving into uh, Eugene, you know, people moving into Eugene, perhaps we can approach the university and see if we can get some sort of course going. Ragadavish Management PhD, or at least a master's program, you know? I mean, think how many years that would have to go on. <laughs> <laughs> if we were going to, and what would the graduating, uh, you know, how would it look to, if one was going to be successful in this, you know, and uh, graduation, and what would graduation day look like, and who would be grading anything? So anyway, okay, enough going off down this line. So Ragadavesha management. So we don't have any, we only have any say over our actions. Therefore, we need to have Ragadavesha management. So how do we handle these Ragadvashas? We'll get to the second part of the verse uh, later. You know, I'm hoping that this is just an Adobe thing. We've got a computer whiz here, so maybe <laughs> you might have to look at this afterwards. It's really having a field day today. Okay, so how do we handle them? So it's not that Ragadvashas in and of themselves are a problem. We can do it afterwards, Craig. It's okay. So, okay. So it's not that they're uh, in and of themselves, they're a problem. Um, we, the the Ragadavashas, we need Ragadavashas. Why do we need Ragadavashas? To survive. <laughs> good, good point, yes. That little thing keeps the body going, right? You know, because if there was no, you know, if hunger didn't come and something say, hey, you know, the fridge, there's some food in the fridge and, you know, let's put that inside. That's what it's doing. So, uh, you know, if that didn't come, then none of us would eat. We wouldn't, you know, and, and imagine if we didn't have a ragadavesha about, you know, uh, if we didn't care about, you know, hygiene, personal hygiene <laughs> or something like that. You know, not only would it be most unsavory to go out and try and buy any food to eat, you know, but uh, anyway, well, it's, uh, it, it would not be good for business. The beauty business would definitely all be going belly up, okay? The economy would go turn upside down on its head. So the, these Ragadavashas, they're not a problem. And nor is the expectation for there being a result. There's no problem with that either. We, we have to have some sort of expectation because who's going to act if I don't have an expectation of a result? And as one of the things Swamiji says, you know, when you put the food in the mouth, you expect that it's going to end up in the stomach. You don't expect it's going to come out of the ear. You know, you expect that it's going to fulfill, you know, that desire, which is saying, oh, you know, hunger, feed me. So you have a certain expectation and it's okay to have those expectations and we need to have them. You expect to reach a certain place. You know, if you're driving the car, you get in the car, you don't get in the car and you think, okay, I need to go to right now to the grocery store and you have an expectation that you're going to end up there. And you may not end up there. Yes, yeah, so you see what's happening, Craig. That's not, not good. So you may, you may end up there and you may not end up there. But you have the expectation that that's where you're going to end up when you get in the car. And sitting in a Vedanta class, you have an expectation. Maybe not after one class, but you do have some sort of expectation that and there's going to be a result. There's going to be some payback from sitting in all of these classes. And so, it's, like I said, we can't remove, it's not that we're not expecting a result, and it's not that they're in and of themselves bad, 
But what we have to learn to do is to accept what comes without criticizing it, without having any sense of failure around it. And this is much easier said than done, as all of us are perfect experts in, I'm sure. And this is why we don't have PhDs in this, because, you know, what, what achievement. We already know it, okay? It's, uh, this just comes along with life. So, <laughs> James saying, Raghadabesha makes the world go round. <laughs> That's the uh, samsara sorry go round, as Swamini Ji says. <laughs> So we have to learn, so we have to learn, and how do we learn? By sitting in Vedanta classes, to accept what comes without, without criticizing it and without having a sense of failure around it. So, and it's funny because we do this in many areas of our, li of our lives. If we put food in and it doesn't digest as expected and it just ends up going straight through, what do we do? We go to the doctor. We go and check out things, or we go to the herbalist, we go to the Ayurvedic doctor, whatever it is. And if the car doesn't reach the destination because the tire goes flat, the, uh, uh, the engine, uh, you know, something happens to the engine, then we, we call someone, we call a, um, we call a garage, you know. <laughs> I'm bringing the mind back in. Uh, I'll, we'll finish up with a funny story in a minute, but for, uh, let's get through this little piece and then we'll go back to the car not reaching the destination. And then at the Vedanta class, um, you know, if, if something doesn't happen after sitting listening to lots of uh, Vedanta classes, what happens? We should be looking at, at, at our Adhikaratvam. We should be then talking with the teacher to see what's going on. So we do, we do know what to do when things don't go as expected, but for some reason we get quite frustrated by uh, other situations. And the, the, other, the other way in which we have to be careful with, this, um, with our actions and is we have to see that idleness and inactivity is not the answer to our regulation management. You cannot sit down and say, okay, I'm just going to sit quietly and then I'm not going to go out, I'm not going to s s talk to anybody, I'm not going to uh, eat anything but these th few things and expect your ragadavashas to become managed at that point. There has to be something going on inside here. There has to be a cognitive change happening because otherwise one is just going to become very, very disgruntled and upset. So these are the, these are the things pointing out that these ragadavashas are not in and, in and of themselves the problem. What is the problem is our expectations of the results. So I'll tell you this, we're, we're going to finish a few minutes early today uh, for two reasons. One, because the computer is having a real computation. I don't know whether it's the computer or whether it's the Adobe Classroom. Um, and the second reason is because Sanskrit, that's right. <laughs> so how did you know that, Nirmala? So uh, th this funny story about expecting the car to be able to, um, to get somewhere. So. Uh, some of you may have heard this. Um, I, I recently was uh, driving from California to Oregon. And uh, I, I don't, it, some of you may know I've been co-authoring a book with a woman, a Muslim from Saudi Arabia about interreligious dialogue. And uh, so she had come to America uh, to meet with Swami Niji and to see how life in the uh, ashram, this small center we have here in Eugene, was. And then Janani went to Saudi Arabia to have the experience the other way around. So as part of this, I had uh, promised her, coming from the desert, as she did, from Saudi Arabia, I promised her that I would show her the redwood trees because as we, Swami Niji was in California at the time, that's where we had to visit her, and then Eugene was here. Instead of flying, I said, we'll just rent a car and drive up. And, you know, you can see the trees and everything, because it's really quite a spectacular thing and something that Pooja Swamiji was very, very fond of, the redwood trees, so it's always a blessing to go and visit, because one gets to be very close to Pooja Swamiji. 
So we get in the car and it's about, uh, I think it's something about 14, 14, 15 hours drive. And so we decided we would split the drive, you know, over a two day period and we'd find somewhere to stay in the, re actually in the Red River Forest on the first, uh, on the night that we, that had to be spent on the road. And so we're driving along and it's getting on late in the day and suddenly and I actually thought it was a train. <laughs> it was making a noise just like a train. And of course it was me driving people, women in Saudi Arabia don't drive, okay? So uh, here I am in my whites, you know, at that time I was wearing the whites and I was in my whites. And of course this uh, woman from Saudi Arabia is in her black abaya, you know, the face covered up and everything. And this train was keeping up with us perfectly. It was absolutely perfectly going along, but nowhere, there was no train in sight. And I, I didn't really notice at first, but on these flash new cars, maybe all cars have them nowadays, I don't know, we, we don't have a flash car. <laughs> so on this car, there was this big light going tire issue or tire problem, something like this, you know, big, big light flashing. And I saw it finally. I went, oh, something wrong with the tire. And luckily on the other side of the road, there was a big lay-by. We were on a two lane highway, you know, one lane each direction in the middle of nowhere, I will say. And uh, we were very lucky. It was a windy road. It's the 101 going up through California, through the Redwoods. And we were so lucky that there was a lay, a lay what do they call them? Lay by? Lay by on the other side of the road. So pulled into there, got out, and sure enough, there was nothing left of this tire, you know, because it had been a train. So, <laughs> so nothing left of the tire. And it was, it was, I was like, oh, and by this time the sun had started going down. Okay, all right, no problem. We'll just pull out the cell phone. You know, we recently moved into the modern 20th century, 21st century, and got a cell phone. Pulled out the cell phone, no cell phone rece reception. Oh, okay. And so this Saudi Arabian woman looks at me and she says, well, can't you change the tire? And I looked at her, I, all in white, I might say, you know, and I looked at her and I said, well, can't you? I don't even drive, she said. How would I know how to change a tire? <laughs> so I said, well, I'm certainly not getting out and changing it, you know, looking like this. And plus, I don't have the body strength to move those nuts. You know, it'll be a, it wouldn't be some electric, you know, thing. I won't have the, the body strength. So I got out of the car and I went out and it was, the sun now was really sinking, it was kind of twilight. And I put my thumb out, you know, and not that there's any cars going by, but you know, thinking that a car will come along soon enough and I put my thumb out. And uh, it, she comes over to me and she says, what are you doing? And I, I said, I said, I'm gonna stop a car. I said, we can't just, you know, we're miles, 10 miles one way. 15 miles the other way from anywhere, you know, that, that's going to be able to help us with this tire. So we have to stop somebody. And she looked at me and she said, this is how horror movies start. <laughs> so I told her gently, I said, go, just get back in the car with you, will you? Yeah. And the, anyway, we, somebody did stop, a very, very nice person. But the real kicker for this was it was two days before Halloween with me dressed in my whites, her in her, you know, her Saudi Arabian get up. I, you know, I thought anybody, put, maybe, maybe that's why someone pulled over was because they didn't, you know, they thought that we were on our way to a Halloween party or something like that. But anyway, so you get in the car, you expect to get somewhere, but you don't get there. And if the story did have a happy ending, we actually, you know, this person stopped, very kindly stopped and uh, changed the tire over for us. Only changed the tire, hefted all the luggage out of the back of the car, because not only did we have things from me, things from uh, this Saudi Arabian woman, but we also had some of Swaminiji's stuff that we were bringing back up to Egypt. So I hefted everything out to get to the tire. So it was a, it was an interesting thing. You don't always get what you expect, and sometimes also 
Luckily, you don't get what you expect. It doesn't turn out to be a horror movie beginning, okay? All right, so we'll pick up here uh, next week and uh, <laughs> turn out. There we go. And the Sanskrit will be on Zoom. I will put Adobe on. Um, and I think you've got um, this. If you don't have the Zoom information, let me know and we'll email it out to you. Okay, let's just say the closing prayer though. Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachate Purnasya Purnamadhaya Purnameva Vashishyate Om Shanti Shanti Hari Om Shri Guru Pyo Namaha Hari Om Okay all right, James, no problem. <laughs> Glad you enjoyed the story. Yes, it was quite funny. And James, I'll let you know. Yes, I will do that. And I will talk to you all who are doing Sanskrit in a little bit, okay? Um. So the 